Hello, Robs. We're back with The Gollum Remembered, 1909 to 1980. Variations of a le Jewish legend, Arnold L. Goldsmith. The passive inhabitants of the Fifth Tower file out, but the Jewish audience in Moscow in 1925 must have laughed with nervous approval as the invisible Gollum rains blows on the startled priest and monk bloodies their noses, and hurls them out the window. The scene ends with the Maharals instructing the Gollum to go to sleep. I think I already read that. But the gothic setting and violence of scene four are in sharp contrast with the simple setting and meditative conversation in scene five. The place is a field at night outside of Prague. Elijah and the Messiah sit by the road and talk. As Madison has pointed out, Levick had been attracted to the Messiah legends for a long time and conceived of the Gollum as the precursor of the Messiah, the son of Joseph, who is to serve as the temporary redeemer at a critical juncture and use force as necessary, which the real Messiah, the son of David, must not employ. Levick portrays, portrays the real Messiah in this scene, as disappointed in his reception. He bemoans the fact that he cannot die with his fellow Jews in Prague and fears a pogrom at the beginning of Passover. When the angry Maharol arrives, arrives, he again orders them to leave. The world has not exhausted yet. Its store of cruelty on us has each of us in every land felt the butcher's knife against his throat. Has he yet heard the final groan or seen the last of lifted swords? The Messiah cannot fight violence with violence. He must be the last. And woe to him if he should try to intercede for us against our will. The Maharal explains that it is another savior who is permitted to do evil, to kill. The Messiah, not knowing whether he has arrived a moment too soon or too late, is depressed because he must leave. The scene ends with the despondent Rabbi Levi, Levi watching a storm brewing. The title of scene six, Revelation, is Levick's pun. This is not St. John's revelation of the apocalypse. It is, however, the first time that the Gollum reveals his true identity to humans other than those present at his creation. Disobeying the Maharal's instructions that he remain mute, Joseph, surrounded by a luminous glow in Tower 5, talks to the madman Tankum, who claims that all the Jews in Prague are now dead. In this setting, reminiscent of the heat scene in King Lear, with its thunder and lightning and various kinds of madness in a world that has gone insane, the Gollum tells Tankum, I am the secret, not of darkness, but of light. Not always, but now. A frightened Deverell enters with her grandmother, looking for the Maharal, since all the Jews of Prague are hiding behind locked doors. The title Revelation is seen once again as Joseph tries to comfort the terrified women with his glow of invisibility hovering over him. Disobeying the Maharal again, he says that this is the first and only time that he will reveal himself, promising not to harm them. He boasts that he is more luminous than the rabbi and messiah, mixing sexual threats and boasts of his tremendous power with promises of safety. Joseph leads them out of the fifth tower, feeling terrible loneliness upon his return to the ruins amidst the thunder and lightning his love unrequited by the people he wants to help. The Gollum falls asleep on the ground where the Maharal finds him and explains that he has only been dreaming the events of the last two days. Now the time has finally come for him to act. Once again, Levick plays with the word revelation. The true revelation comes as Rabbi Levi reveals the word blood to the Gollum and starts him on the sacred mission for which he was created. As the scene ends, the insane Tankum crosses the stage, asking who can rescue the Jews. Mendel Kohansky in the Hebrew theater, its first 50 years, says that it is reported that at one performance, some young communists in the audience stood up at this point, shouted, we will, and sang the Internationale. In the... <laughs> 
In the penultimate scene, Levick pulls out all the stops and lets his imagination soar. The setting is a cave in a subterranean area of Tower 5. Mimetic representation is quickly replaced with surrealistic effect. The blood libel plot so familiar to modern readers of the legends of the Golem is the core situation. But the supernatural effects, the dancing shadows of the torchlight and underground, the lyric verse, the allegorical figures, all combine to make this one of the drama's most memorable scenes, even though the meaning is sometimes murky. As the scene begins, the monk explains to Thaddeus how he has carried out the priest's order, cutting the throat of the victim and bottling his blood. Both men flee as the Maharal and Gollum enter. Rabbi Levi, Levi is presented by evil is prevented by evil spirits from following the path to the hidden bottles. Only the Gollum can proceed and overcome such obstacles as a rock slide, barking hounds, and a fire which chars his clothing but not his body. The frightened Gollum calls for the Maharal as the spirits of the cave dance and spin around him dimming his luminosity. What appears as the Maharal's figure, but probably is not, threatens him with his staff and commands him to obey. I am master. I can do what with you whatever I please to do. I do not harm you because I toy with you, with you and your fears and with your sorrows. Beyond that, I have no need of you. Stop staring, Gollum, dimwit, hunk of meat. <laughs> Shut tight your gaping eyes, fall to the ground and lie there. Fall, fall, I say. The golem sinks to the ground. Well done, your head down. Lower, lower. The terribly confused golem suddenly is guided by a force identified only as the invisible. Perhaps Rabbi, Rabbi Levy, who is using his cabalistic lore, but more likely God himself, who shakes him, reveals himself this one time, this one time, and then shows him a bundle hidden at his feet, which contains two bottles of blood. A joyous dance of the dead who have been waiting for redemption now takes place around the bottles as the golem watches in terror. The awkward dead welcome to the expected arrival of the three redeemers, the golem already present, the Messiah, and Jesus Christ, and predict the approaching death of Joseph, he sits down inside a prescribed circle just before the Messiah. Enchained is pushed hard by an invisible hand into the cave. The young beggar accepts his destiny to remain there with the other two redeemers while the world goes its way. And three shape a piece, a piece, a piece forever from today. To emphasize their shared identity as saviors, the Gollum and the Messiah repeat each other's words. When the Messiah complains of thirst, the Gollum offers him the blood in the two bottles, but the young beggar is repelled and calls out in alarm. At this point, the man with the cross is pushed into the cave. He, com his, he complains of his loneliness, pain, and rejection. Though he praises and forgives God, his master, the Gollum welcomes Christ into the sacred circle and offers him a drink from the bottles to quench his thirst. But he gets the same horrified reaction he got from the Messiah. The cave spirits now return and do a lively dance around the three redeemers, promising to protect them and be their loyal subjects, their redeemers. When the cave spirits depart, the dead reappear with their song of eternal, eternal nothingness. There is nothing more to sing. There is the cross, but not to carry. There is the chain, but not to ring. There's the ax, but not the hairy. So we sing the song of nothing. Christ need no longer feel the weight of the cross. The Messiah need not feel the restraint of the chain. And the Gollum need no longer wield his heavy ax. As the dead finish their song of madness, they return to the grave, the candles in their hands going out. After a few moments of total darkness, the Maharal appears and chastises the Gollum, who is sitting in silence, gaping like a madman. Joseph at first does not recognize his master and wants to be left alone, far removed from the blood. But Rabbi Levy tells him he cannot remain. Your life is now at stake. Your mission still is not fulfilled. 
He pities the terrified Gollum, but insists that he leave the darkness and be restored to his former brightness. This scene parallels and reinforces the opening one. When the Gollum pleaded in vain not to come into this world, now Joseph embraces the Maharal and welcomes him. The final scene, the last mission, takes place in the anteroom of the old synagogue on a Friday evening. The unkempt Gollum is testy and slams the door behind the gathering worshippers. He argues with the Shamus and refuses to put on his other shoe, complaining all the while that the rabbi has not visited him in a week. Levick makes no attempt to bridge the gap and explain what has happened since the last scene. The audience must make some remarkable assumption, assumptions that the blood libel has been proved false with the re revelation of Thaddeus's plot, the false accusers punished and the Jewish community saved. Tower 5 need no longer be a refuge. Levick shows no interest in such routine details already known by those familiar with the legends. He is far more interested in the personality of the Gollum, the conscience of the Maharal, and the theme of the brutality of force, the insatiable appetite of violence. The Shamus is unaware of these larger, deeper implications and can only support the rigidity of the law. It is forbidden to walk barefoot in a synagogue, he says. And he calls Joseph a savage and a madman, a riddle he cannot understand. Apparently, Joseph has not been able to sleep for three nights, and he claims that he is unaware of the miracle. The shamus refers to probably the defeat, the defeat of Thaddeus. Joseph has felt cast aside ever since the strange adventure in the cave. When two of the inhabitants of Tower 5 come in, they recognize Joseph and discuss his, discuss his past erratic behavior. There is some momentary comic relief, as the redhead says. You mark my words, there's something curious in this more than meets the eye. And his companion, the tall man, replies, no mystery at all, a clod, a golem. Here, Levick cannot resist punning on the word, using it in his vernacular sense. The redhead recollects how the golem beat up Thaddeus the night they were forced to abandon Tower 5. But the events of that memorable night remain a mystery to them. The Gollum becomes aroused as he hears these men describe the boarding up of the windows and doors of Tower 5. He wants to return, screaming for the rabbi and banging on the wall. As he rushes at the men threateningly, the Maharal enters and subdues him with a stern look and a single command. Joseph claims that Rabbi Levy has deserted him now that the mission has been fulfilled. And he begs the rabbi to stay with him. In a new twist to the legend, the Maharal reveals that he gave Joseph the freedom to go wherever he desired, but Joseph chose to stay. Joseph confesses that he now knows that the Maharal controls his life. He pleads with the rabbi to abandon the world and stay with him forever in the anteroom. The compassionate rabbi sympathizes with this tortured creature. So much unrest in your heart and so much hate, so much dark passion and cold anger and helplessness flow in your veins. How can the fault be yours? Rabbi, rabbi Levy explains to Joseph his foolish hope that you would save yourself. Find peace and start to live as all live, as Jews live. But that was his mistake. Force begets force and becomes uncontrolled. When the Maharal refuses to let the Gollum return to Tower 5, Joseph loses his temper, commands him to stay, and grabs his arm, threatening the unflinching rabbi with his fist. In this war of wills, the Maharal easily wins, and Joseph sinks to the floor in a tantrum as the rabbi enters the synagogue. Left alone, the frustrated Gollum grabs his axe, contemplates attacking the Jews at prayer, then shatters the window and rushes out into the street. The Maharal rescues Joseph from the angry crowd, but two Jews have already been struck down. Alone with Joseph in the anteroom, the rabbi asks him if he realizes that he has hurt the people he was created to save. The, Ma the Maharal accepts the blame himself and asks, are we thus punished for our joy, O Lord? Are we chastised because we wish to save ourselves? Did you not grant approval? Was not this done through you?
But then the Maharal sees himself as one of the patriarchs tried by God, or perhaps as another Job. Did you reveal to me the more than human? Allow me to create, to rule, command, only that I might see at last my insignificance, my massive sin, and more than that, my sin against all Jews, that in impatience and despair, I wish to turn my back on those ways of your people that are eternal, gentle, patient, full of faith, my sin in wanting what the foe lays claim to. The Maharal tells God, you open wide my eyes to see that I lack wholly any power over fists. The rabbi now realizes that he is the golem's captive. The master has become the slave. At this climactic moment, Deverell runs in to ask her grandfather to come comfort her crying grandmother. Joseph thinks the girl has come to stay with him also, but she calls him murderer and struggles to free herself from his grasp, deaf to the softness of his plea. How sweet is the aroma of your hair, how warm your hands. Why do you run from me? Deverell struggles hopelessly until the Maharal regains his composure and yells at Joseph, who releases the girl, sending his granddaughter to the congregation to inform them that their rabbi is coming. The Maharal instructs the golem on his final mission. The final task, you see, the candles all are dying down. A single light, the last still flickers. Soon it too will die. You must make haste. Rabbi Levi then commands the reluctant but obedient Gollum to lie on the ground with outstretched arms and return him to clay with the simple words, I issue this decree, let hands and feet and body with its limbs and sinews return unto the rest, breathe out your final breath. Amen. With only the prayer and none of the more elaborate Kabbalistic ritual mentioned in previous legends of the Gollum, Levick has the creature returned to the earth from whence he came. The drama ends on a note of a religious affirmation as the Maharal instructs the Shamas to call in the Jews to sing again the psalm of Sabbath praise. The Reception and Meaning of Levick's, Levick's Gollum According to Kohansky, Moscow reviews of Levick's Gollum in March 1925, though not enthusiastic, were good, and the public responded well. Audiences seemed to sense what the censors missed. Levick's disillusionment with the Bolshevik Revolution and its violent destruction of Jewish cultural and communal life makes it possible to read the play as a parable. Kohansky believes that the Gollum is the revolution, a creature of violence, like the revolution, he was created with good intentions, but having found a life of his own, turned away from the intentions of his creator to embark on a rampage of senseless destruction. Unaware of such a political reading of the play, the Moscow censors insisted on only one deletion, the scene with the ghosts in the cave. This they found objectionable on the grounds that it fostered superstition. The role of the golem was played by Aaron Meskin, Judging by the full-page photograph in Kohansky's book, no attempt was made to imitate the monster makeup and mask popularized in the German film versions. According to Kohansky, Meskin's powerful physique, rough-hewn face, and deep voice were idea for the part, and he invested the inhuman creature with the humanity and warmth that gave the golem a new dimension not found in the text. When the Habima Company opened its tour in Palestine in April 1928, with a performance of the Gollum, the premiere was considered an event of major cultural importance. The reviews appeared the next day on the front page. The Zionist-oriented reviewer of Ha Aretz did not like the play, and Kohansky quotes him as writing, the Gollum is not a play of high quality. It has rather cheap moments, which probably cause a great deal of enthusiasm among, among the Jews in the diaspora among the Gentiles, but Palestine does not like it. We speak of the excessive exploitation of the synagogue and religion in general. Neither will Palestine accept all that ghost business. We here have conquered many ghosts, or at least make efforts to conquer them. For a more... 
appreciative understanding of Leavick's drama, the most incisive analysis is that of the play's translator, Joseph C. Landis, who writes, Man, suffering, lonely, yearning for redemption, sometimes purified by his sufferings to look with compassion on the sufferers of his fellows. Man is at the center of his 21 plays in prose and verse and his 10 volumes of poetry, and Man is at the center of the Gollum, his first published play. To Landis, the Gollum is not only a political parable, but also a philosophical mor morality play. in which the Jews become symbolic of a mankind suffering, innocently suffering in spite of its innocence. It is a play about mankind's yearning for redemption, and it is a play in which the Jews, as bearers of redemption in peace and justice, suffer because that vision runs counter to the ways of the world. Looking at the drama from another, more modern perspective, Landis sees the tragedy of Rabbi Levy as the tragedy of the creator whose creation does not respond in accordance with this, his plan. The tragedy of the social dreamer whose dreams are frustrated, who discovers that force contaminates and consumes. The Gollum is the tragedy of innocent man who, tired of being the eternal victim, learns that suffering is the inescapable lot of man. That endurance and the wisdom of endurance, compassion for the sufferers, are the only alternatives open to man as man. Reality is a hard teacher. The Maharal learns, open, learns that the traditional wisdom of his people is rooted in the nature of reality, that whatever the temporary effect of the fist, it cannot solve the human condition. Rabbi Levy is not the only one in Levick's drama to learn an important lesson. The Gollum learns the pain of the individual's loneliness, not wanting to be born into this world. Once here, he discovers that it is only it is the only life possible. The Maharal cannot prevent the inevitable human qualities of fear and sorrow, pity and temptation from imprinting themselves upon the Gollum's heart. When the Gollum comes to life, he learns not only to bend his head and chop wood, he learns the sorrow of loneliness, the need for love, the fear of death, the temptation to wield power and destroy. No sooner does he become a man than he begins to long for love and to dream of his own redemption. The play is rich in ironies. The Gollum, the principle of force, yearns for peace and love, and the Maharal, the principle of peace creates force. And the Gollum, the man that to his creator was a thing, is a thing become a man. It is these very ironies that appealed to the creative imagination of H. Levick in 1921 and continue to appeal to readers of his powerful drama six decades later. And that ends chapter four. Gustav Men Meyrink and the Psychological Gothic Chapter 5 are next. Goodbye, bruv. Goodbye.